<laughs> oh, this is quicker than I thought. Automatic transmission technology has come a long way since two speeds like the famous Power Glide. Since gasoline combustion engines are emissions mandated to be ran at or near stoichiometric air fuel ratio, the increasing number of gears are a major reason for improved fuel mileage and efficiency on late model cars. But what happens when your project car has an older, less advanced transmission that starts acting up? Is it worth the trouble and cost of swapping in newer technology to reap the potential benefits? Our customer has an LS3 swapped C3 Stingray and is in this exact situation. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to answer these questions and maybe teach you some stuff along the way. But before we begin, I need a big favor. Take a second right now and hit like and leave a comment. When we take time to make this video, we are turning away paying work. We run a small business and it's a busy shop. So we don't have a huge audience yet and it just doesn't make financial sense for us to put the effort into videos over fixing cars. But I know there's so much stuff here at FMU that the automotive world would think is really neat. And I wanna do my best to share this stuff with you guys so that small gesture is like saying, thanks for entertaining me for 15 minutes. I appreciate our viewers and want to get better so that little effort really helps us out a lot. All right, Donnie here usually talks to the customers. Um, you probably talk to Mr. Mills and know what he's looking to try to correct. So what's he got going on? So essentially this thing has a real rough uh, shift from first to second. It's super lurchy, like to the point where it almost feels like it's gonna break traction going around corners and it's like throwing him back in the seat. Um, that developed after his most recent road trip. So it was fine before that. And then by the time he got back home, it was acting really rough. So he brought it in more or less to take a look. I know he was saying that uh, on that road trip too, he didn't like where the RPMs were sitting, so. Yeah, it's, it's only a, a five speed, so it chills pretty high in the rev range when he's highway cruising. Yeah, I know um, that our preliminary inspection revealed some pretty heavy metal shavings in the pan, and it's looking like this thing's on its way out, so, um, you know. Yeah, are... and I think they mentioned there was no uh, no trans fluid on the dipstick either. It was leaking out. Yeah, so we already got major problems and we know kind of what we're gonna have to do. Yeah. The classic Chevy Stingway was rocking an LS3 engine swap shifted by this 4L65E transmission. With an LS3 under the hood, we needed a transmission that could keep up, but that would be reasonable to swap over both physically as well as computer control. Since the LS3 was mated to the 6L80E in the GM Performance Connect and Cruise package that we've dealt with in the past, it seemed like a no-brainer. In fact, it made us question why it wasn't done initially as part of the swap. Well, we soon figured out as to why when we went down the rabbit hole of research needed to make this decision and then lined the swap up. The 6L80E and the 4L65E transmissions are both products of General Motors, but they are worlds apart in terms of performance, durability, and versatility. First, let's talk about gear ratios, the driving force of any transmission. As you can see, the 6L80E is stealing the spotlight here. Users rave about its superior ratios. Whether you're maximizing fuel efficiency on the highway, towing a boat, or unleashing raw power for some spirited driving, the 6L80E shines bright. Comparisons are made about the functionality either. They'll gush over the seamless transitions and enhanced control it brings to the driving experience. All right, let's talk about weight. The 4L65E weighs in at 135 pounds, while the 6L80E is a bit heavier at a respectable 160 pounds. The extra two gears had to weigh something, right? Now we all need our fluids. So the 4L65E sips on 12 quarts, but the thirstier 6L80E is requiring 13.5. Now talking about fluids, they both love Dextron, but the 4L65E goes for the three edition, while the internals of the 6L80E likes to bathe in Dextron 6. Where do these transmissions feel at home? The 4L65E typically parties in half-ton trucks, vans, and SUVs, 
while the 6L80E prefers some sophistication of cars like sedans and sports cars. Let's talk gas mileage, my friends. The 4L65E and the 6L80E have different gear ratios, and the number of gears and that ability to keep the car cruising at lower engine RPM means more MPG for the 6L80. Power, power, power. That's what we all want, right? Well, according to a lot of testimonials that you can look up online, a stock 6L80E can handle more power than a meticulously built 4L65E. Imagine that. Folks who invested in a fully upgraded 4L65E with all the bells and whistles are finding the 6L80E effortlessly surpassing them. The ability of the stock 6L80E to handle increased power with a torque rating of 650 pounds per square foot without breaking a sweat could make one consider doing the switch. Let's talk about endurance and longevity, two critical factors when it comes to transmissions. Now, durability is crucial, and both can go the distance, but the 6L80 might have a bit more permanence. Reports of the trucks in the UAE running nine second quarter mile times with the 6L80E means we're not just dealing with the transmission, we're dealing with the beast. We've regularly seen 6L80E equipped transmissions surpassing 200,000 miles, proving that this transmission is not a sprinter, it's also a marathon runner. But it does have its known potential issues. With proper maintenance and tuning adjustments, however, the 6L80 can go the distance. The 4L65E might be the older sibling, but hey, it's earned its reputation. When it comes to hauling, the 4L65E was good for its day, but times are changing. The 6L80E is the new kid on the block, with six gears offering precision and control, as well as an underrated higher torque rating. Now, we won't geek out too hard, but something should be noted about the torque converter lockup strategies, especially when it comes to the tunability. The 6L80E, flexibility in this department is especially good if you don't stick with the stock tuning, which can cause premature failure. The aftermarket has largely addressed this issue, but feedback from user experiences and tuning have made this really not a problem anymore. Being able to tailor the lockup strategy to reduce the slip and enhance efficiency is more or less a game changer. And that's a critical advantage the 6L80E has to bring to the table over the 4L65. Shift happens, right? The 4L65E relies on hydraulics. A bit old school, but effective. The 6L80E though is the cool hybrid kid, blending hydraulics and electronics. Simply put, it's more modern. But let's not forget the driving experience. Enthusiasts who've made the leap from the 4L65E to the 6L80 usually are all smiles. The improved one to two jump compared to the 4L65's normal gap in ratios gives you a smoother, more enjoyable ride. While some users have made it a point that the 6L80 isn't as good as it could be out of the box, they benefit from a trans tune to improve power delivery and shift control, especially in situations where the 4L65E might have struggled. So with all that info, it might seem like we've got a clear winner. Well, it depends on your car's driving personality and your driving style. The 4L60E might be the more modern standard, but hey, for the price of a 4L65E and some upgrade parts, you might have something tough enough for your project with money left over to spend. So is it worth it to have more MPGs and a lower RPM? Hopefully this info helps you make that decision. Lastly, compatibility issues and the need for professional installation. This for us was not a straightforward swap. We really wanted it to be a straightforward swap. Oftentimes I'll make the mistake of assuming that because it's something LS and domestic based, that it's probably been done before and someone has a clear answer to getting it in there. And this was not the case on this car. Even though it said it was a swap kit from the 4L65E to the 6L80E, finding the right information is gonna be the most critical part, whether it's your automotive shop that's gonna be taking on the job or it's DIY. It's very crucial that it goes beyond just having correct wiring diagrams. And that project that might seem like a few hour project could easily turn into a multi-hour project with some added expenses that you didn't plan for. Okay, we gave you lots of pros and cons of these two transmissions, and you might be thinking, I don't have an LS swapped or anything. I'm planning to ever switch my transmissions. So what's in this video for me? I'm not forgetting about you. Now, assume that everyone watching would have a basic understanding of an automatic transmission, but I'm probably wrong about that. So 
Very quickly, here's what your car's transmission can be equated to if you think about a bike, right? You know when you change gears in a bike to make it easier or harder to pedal depending on the terrain? A car's transmission does something similar, but it does it automatically for you. Now getting into exactly when and how it does that is a much more in-depth affair. But for simplicity's sake, you understand that every car has an engine that has this sweet spot for power and fuel efficiency in the RPM range. However, your car doesn't always move at the same speed, right? That's where a transmission comes in. Now back to the bike for a minute. You're riding and you encounter a hill. If you're in a high gear, it's tough to pedal up, but you'd go faster if you were traveling on flat ground. If you're in a low gear, it's much easier to pedal up, but you might not go as fast on flat ground. In a car, we have different gears for different situations. Here's where gear ratios come in. In each gear, the transmission is like a different size of gear on your bike. The transmission swaps between these gears. Its aim is to keep the engine running in this sweet spot. Whether you're starting from a stop, cruising on the highway, climbing a hill, or doing a quarter mile pass. Why more gears? Well, imagine you're on a bike with only two gears, one for going slow and one for going fast. It might work, but it's not the most efficient or enjoyable ride. The same goes for cars. The more gears allow the engine to stay in this sweet spot for more often improving fuel efficiency and performance. Hence here, the four versus six gears in this particular swap. Having more gears also means smoother transitions between speeds. It's like having more steps on a staircase instead of big leaps. This makes your driving experience more comfortable, but it also helps your car use fuel more efficiently. As I said earlier, fuel efficiency and emissions is a huge reason we're now seeing these eight, nine, and even 10 speed transmissions. What if you aren't really worried about your miles per gallon though? Well, like this customer, having a cruising highway speed result in a lower engine RPM can make the vehicle more tolerable. For most, 70 miles an hour at 3,800 RPMs is much more irritating than 70 miles an hour at 2,200 RPMs. And like we mentioned before about efficiency, the engine most likely will use less fuel at a lower RPM, meaning more MPGs. This is without getting into the advancement between the tech of the two transmissions, as well as the increased power holding rating. While it seems like I'm saying more gears is better, I'm not. In this application, it's worth it for the customer to upgrade. Take the eight speed 8L90E. More gears and newer trans tech must mean better. Nope. This transmission is notorious for poor durability and shift quality. Sometimes having more moving parts adds unneeded complication. The ever-moving target of fuel efficiency that is mandated to increase year after year, regardless of the cost, results in some victims. And as we're seeing, good reliable setups are being made obsolete to try to seemingly make more efficient models that end up actually failing more often. I often wonder if this is the chase for lower carbon emissions that we're somehow forgetting that the waste that these complications and failure prone technologies will create. Is it worth it? That's uh, too in depth for this video, but let's continue. All right, so I actually spent a lot of time when initially researching this swap because my fear was that anything we tried to homebrew would take so many hours that it would just become cost ineffective for the customer. Even with my research, finding a company that said it more or less was a straight swap, it wasn't a straight swap. The electrical was probably, in my opinion, the most time consuming, would you agree with that? For sure, and it was definitely confusing with the connected cruise harness that we were sent. There was a lot of extra wires that I just kind of kept chasing my tail on, trying to figure out where they went. But once I understood what was going on, it was easy to cut open the original harness and find where it needed to connect to. Even though we got a 6L80E swap for the LS3 engine, this wasn't a 6L80E swap for a C3 Corvette. So uh, another one of the hurdles that I know you had to figure something out for was the shift linkage and the drive shaft length, um, both of those uh, I know that needed some modification. Yeah, so luckily with the drive shaft, they do sell us a longer slip yoke, which after a few tries we got correct. Then up here, the shift linkage had to be modified. New transmission cooler lines made and ran, especially the one of the differences between the transmissions. The cooler lines on the four speed are on this side six feet are on the opposite side. So do we have to get new lines for that or make new lines? They basically just made them. New rubber holes with AN fittings up to the trans cooler in front. And then how about just mounting the thing in there? I know that the, uh, the six speed will bolt right to the LS, but I doubt 
with its being a little bit bigger, it bolted right into whatever mount that they had constructed to get this engine and in, in transit into place in the beginning. Mounting location was different, so we basically had to cut it and start over in the middle here and then drill new holes that matched up to the transmission mount. Then I think the only other thing was since the four speed, the starter wires went through the range switch, we had to route those differently right up to the original starter switch. And then lastly, I know that um, the park neutral switch was in a different location. Yeah, so that was the same thing, cutting open the original harness, finding those wires, then running it to the shifter itself up there, along with the reverse wires. And then you got this thing running, I've seen you driving it. Um, I know we really haven't done much to the engine program or computer yet. Uh, how's it running so far? It's awesome. Shifts so nice, plenty of speeds available, especially with this rear end. It's well over three to one, so it's gonna be nice for cruising. Yeah, th that was his biggest complaint was that um, it just had too high of an RPM range. And I think the best way to relate that to people is go on the highway, drive like you normally drive and downshift one gear and see if you'd be happy with it sitting there revving much, much higher. Having an extra two speeds in this trans, I'm sure makes a big difference in just the livability of this car. I think the owner will be really happy with that. Um, along with the fact that he's got something that should be a little tougher in there. Wow, I think Keller was right. This thing really does shift very nicely. I'm actually very surprised with how smooth this is shifting and how little input we had to make electronically to get the two transmissions to communicate. Uh, this is pretty surprising that more or less all we did was wiring and uh, this thing's acting perfectly normal. Now, cold tires and a cold temperature um, are two things that, coupled with a suspension that's not up to the power level and the shifting firmness of the vehicle, kind of make me want to stay out of this, but maybe I'll get into it a little bit. Wow, power delivery is really nice. You can tell the torque converter is holding really well. This setup is just really well paired for the LS3 as it should be, it was made for it. So all in all, I'm really impressed with how this turned out. And I think the owner is gonna be super impressed as well. Took a little effort, but I think this is something that I'm proud that we recommended and were able to see through. <laughs> Ooh, this is quicker than I thought. All right, so some closing thoughts about this little project that we had. Now, if taking on this project and changing your transmission is something you're looking to do. Again, research beforehand is gonna be critical. The reason we went with this particular package was because we thought the installation would be more straightforward. However, when we got down to doing it, there was still quite a bit of input that it took for us to put into this job. And when we're pricing it from a shop point of view, we always hate to be adding hours, although, in this case, it's something that we had to do. So keep that in mind when you're trying to decide if this is an option that you wanna explore. Again, though, there's nothing wrong with staying with a older transmission with less speeds and just beefing that thing up if that's where your budget leaves you to. However, putting in the more speed, more torque holding transmission in this case really ended up being the right way to go. That's it for today. Remember guys, keep hitting the like, keep hitting subscribe and leave those comments. Every little bit helps. Till next week, we'll see ya.